Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. A recurring guest, a recurring guest, Sabaton's the one, the only singer of Sabaton. We could say that. <laughs> the one constant. <laughs> the Joaquin Broden. Is it Broden? Hello. Broden? Broden? How do you pronounce it? Uh, Broden. Broden. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> like oh, I say, it was, seems like it was just yesterday we had you on. It was actually last August. And all I can say is congratulations. This is a masterpiece, this album. War Thank you. To, war to End All Wars. I, I I can't get enough of it. Uh, I've been listening to it nonstop. For me, this is your Operation Mindcrime. This is your Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, those are bold words. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is an amazing, amazing album. So let's just get that. It's a masterpiece. That's the word I will use for this album. Moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> the War to End All Wars going to be released on March the 4th via Nuclear Blast. So... Yes. Where do we start? Where do we start here? Where do we start? World War One. Back to World War One. I. I mean, yeah, we thought it's sort of, you know, our previous album, The Great War, obviously dealt with the same conflict. And uh, we, when we were doing that album, we sort of had two stories. Well, we had several stories we felt that we were leaving behind, but two ones we really wanted. And those were The Christmas Truce and the story of the Harlem Hellfighters. And, uh, well, we didn't have the right music. So we thought, oh, we'll do them another time then because it's better for us. At least we figured out that if we don't have the right music or feel, feel it at the moment, it's better we take it later. And that in combination with when we released The Great War, we got a, such an amount of books and emails from fans and friends, you know, telling us stories of you heard about this. And a lot of moments it was like, how haven't we heard about this, you know? <laughs> How did we miss this? And then, of course, the pandemic coming in, we were supposed to, I guess, tour on the Great War until yeah, late 2021, I guess. But since we couldn't do that, and there were still certain places on this planet we haven't played, we thought, well, if we do another album, we can tell some of those stories our fans and friends told us. We can get the Christmas Truce and Harlem Hellfighters in there. And also, when we go to, let's say, Latin America, Australia, Japan, where we didn't get to tour on the Great War tour, those songs that are from the Great War aren't going to feel, well, irrelevant because they're in the same conflict instead of going to a Napoleonic era album, which would make right. no sense at all to play a song about Lawrence of Arabia. I, I, I'm going to, you know, I, I just want to ask you the first thing, like just a little backtrack. You were on tour with Judas Priest. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I just I just have to ask you this question. What do you remember when Richie Faulkner fell? We'll get back to the album. I just want to know what do you remember? Like what happened there? Like what was your you know perception? I had no I had no idea he fell at all, actually. Because we uh, were out uh I didn't watch their show. I was probably in the dressing room showering or at the hotel uh, where we had the showers for that festival. And uh we came back to the bus when after Metallica were done playing. You know, so this, this is quite a long time after it's supposed to happen. And uh, a few of us were drinking and some of Judas Priest's crew came in to our bus even, you know, asking, hey, what happened? Oh. And they, a few of them said like, yeah, did you hear about Richie? We're like, what? No, he, he was bad and he had to go with the paramedics. And that was it. And we thought, okay, well, we had to go with the paramedics. He wasn't feeling good. And that's all we knew. So we kept on blasting Van Halen and jumping in the tour bus pretty much. And felt like assholes when we woke up the next morning in Kansas City and got the call in that, you know, you'd been in 10 and a half hour, 10 and a half hour surgery. So, yeah. So we, and actually we didn't just, know until the day after. We just interviewed him yesterday. He's doing great. The doctors are giving him the okay. And he's going to be out uh, traveling and touring, of course, at the north america well that's the best news i've heard in fucking months the power mm -hmm. of heavy metal saved him <laughs> <laughs> literally well he has the metal god in the back so you <laughs> <expect> <laughs> it. what else do you need what else do you need 
And the only reason I'm asking you is because, you know, your tour also, you know, you went all the way to America. It's not like you're in America and you had to like bail too. Like you had to stop. Yep. Uh, we managed to do one final show in Denver, Colorado, because um, we were already on our way there. We had, I think, a photo session or something lined up as well. We had some things to take care of. And then we thought, like, is this really going to be the last show of this tour? Yeah. That's weird. So we figured Denver has been usually been a good city for us to play in. So we thought, what would happen if we actually booked a venue and said we're playing in 24 hours and that's what we did and yeah the venue filled up and a whole bunch of Sabaton fans made it some people even from Europe I don't know how they even made it into the US with the travel <laughs> ban and quarantine but uh, yeah something <laughs> somebody <laughs> needs to check your borders you know even Europeans coming in on flights or you know <laughs> walking in to go to heavy metal shows uh, and uh, but they're stopping us from having tanks at the border on the other hand so yeah, yeah. yeah you would you would think <laughs> exactly <laughs> you would That's hope the first mistake we did we, we wrote it down in this uh, chamber of commerce you know uh, document with all the list of all your equipment all the serial numbers and everything you need to tell the sort of the chamber of commerce in sweden so they can tell the chamber of commerce in the us or wherever you're going basically that this is what we're bringing in and out so you're not smuggling stuff and yeah the first time we sort of wrote tank you know that gave us problems now oh, it's tank, a, machine gun uh yeah, 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 stuff like grenades <laughs> no, it's, oh, it's stage stage prop in the shape of that. <laughs> hey let's get back to this album i mean it's just too great to talk about i just i you know the whole feeling right from the beginning i guess you I don't know my opera too well, but you can call this an overture with uh, with uh, Sarajevo, and it kind of lays out everything. And I love the Lord of the Rings kind of uh, Lady Gadri- uh, Garadriel, Ga- Ga- whatever her name, Galadriel, <laughs> feel to it on the closer and the opener. You know, it gives you it gives you those uh, goosebumps almost right away. Yeah, we, we tried uh, Bethan Bethan Dixon Bates, her name. Uh, we tried her for the Great War History Edition. And it, we really loved how it turned out because we always wanted to, you know, central for us is not only the music, but also telling the stories. And sometimes the stories don't come across. A lot of times people sort of, I like this song, what's it about? And then they sort of Google and try and find out. But in a situation where we have the history edition of the album, with short narration, you know, before or after the song, sort of setting the scene and getting you into the whole thing. It really, really helps uh, for people to understand, especially the first couple of times you're listening. Yeah. Because yeah. if you hear, you know, a song and you don't understand, and you're not really into military history, there's a whole lot of stuff you're gonna miss. But if you get that hint, uh, it's a great way to get you introduced to the album, sort of. But uh, the history edition, we also have the regular, of course. Not everything is with narration because, yeah, when you're drinking with friends and having a barbecue, you don't want to listen to that, you know. Well, I, 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 I like the way it's all condensed in like four and a half minute, minutes. You know, the whole beginning of World War One is all condensed in four and a half minutes. That's what so. you got to do. Yeah. That's what you got to do. And the whole, uh, the whole conflict is to condense the two albums. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, I, I, to Alan's point and to your point, like you have two bookends, right? You have the beginning and the ending. And the beginning is sort of, it spells it out what's going on. And the ending is sort of like, wait a second, this might not be over yet. You know, part yeah. two coming, right? <laughs> <laughs> a sequel. <laughs> yeah. But but I want to say this is what I really appreciated about this album. Hellfighters. I, I found the song, like, first of all, I'm a big World War One buff. Like I, I you know, I, I read up a lot about World War One and, and the craziness of it all. But I like Hellfires, and I'll tell you why, because you'll part I'll let you explain it, but it's the Harlem fighters, Hellfighters, right? That sort of the the black Americans, uh, the minorities who don't have any rights in their own country. Um, fighting for a country that they have no rights for or no, no equal rights. And that's what I, I, it really hits home. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's like one of those. I mean, the power of the story, the underdog element, everybody loves an underdog in this, you know, in any story. And also, let's be honest, if there ever was a unit that had a perfect name for a heavy metal song, <laughs> Hellfighters, really? Yeah, I mean, it, you can't make that up. That's free real estate. We're going to claim it, you know. But, <laughs> but I, it's actually I, I, one of I the, love one how you of get, stories yeah. 
you know, coming off of the Great War, we felt like, oh, we really want to. That is a great story. Christmas. It's a great story. And, 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 you know, and just to tie it in, sorry, Alan, Lady of the Dark. Now, here's a woman who probably at that time probably did not have the same rights as men, right? Globally, but she's, Ooh. you know. Yeah, fighting. I don't think there were voting rights for women in Serbia at that de time. De depends even where you live. Yeah, and I even if even did they even have voting at all? <laughs> That's what I yeah yeah exactly. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, but it's interesting how the minorities or the minority, the people who are pushed aside in society, they were the heroes of the war. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, in in, in many cases, um, there are. I mean, we do go down the rabbit hole with our research sometimes. We have held friends who are experts to help us. We are, we are amateurs after all. You know, we're not historical experts by any means, but we are really passionate about it. And I think for every album, there's like one or two stories we come across um, that are really makes us think: Why isn't there a major Hollywood movie about this? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> but in the case of you know certain people, it's understandable. Uh, I, maybe Hollywood has no interest in making a movie about a Serbian woman <laughs> that nobody's ever heard of, basically. <laughs> but I yeah. think at least maybe because nobody's heard of her. So maybe if we tell the story, somebody, I mean, this is not only about us telling the story to gain fame in Serbia, but the Serbs uh, who are interested in history already know about her. This is about telling the rest of the world, hopefully, Hopefully, Steven Spielberg will think it's a great story and tell her story, you know? Well, he watches yeah, the yeah. show, so you never know. Yeah. <laughs> I heard he's a huge man fan. <laughs> well, but I mean, you got, you know, Stormtroopers. It's an upbeat song. You got that ex except like chanting in the middle eight. And then, uh, you know, it's a speed, uh, quite a quite a quick paced song. So uh, that's another. I mean, every song, there's not a weak song on the album. Well, thank you. <laughs> you know what? To me, will always be the the, the Christmas truth there. Um, the Christmas truce. That to me, like I, I remember there was, a, I don't know if it was, was it Saving Private Ryan or which movie was it where they actually played that scene out? I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie where they actually. I think they, they actually made a movie of it. They made a movie of it where both sides were actually. Movie, but Saving Private Ryan is World War II, so it shouldn't be that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Ra erase that. Ra wrong, wrong Sabaton album. <laughs> No, but, I, I do like, know they they shall not grow old. I, I don't remember what the name was, but I did see it. It was a good movie. Yeah, I don't know. But that, that for me, that's a, you know that's another huge single off the album. Uh, and you know what I like about it? It gives you space to breathe. It seems like you understand the whole story. It's got a hopeful sentiment. You can enjoy it, and it's uh, it just like it breathes well. If I can say that on that song. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's actually the one of the first songs, or the first song written for the album, because it was one of the ones we, we got to get this right now. So a lot of pressure on that one. But on the other hand, it's, it's a weird one, because it's got a lot of piano, a lot of orchestra, and I, I don't know, some people have picked up, but it's not very few, but it's actually a waltz, you know. <laughs> <laughs> bum, 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 uh, yeah. But you can absolutely dance a waltz to it. And... Uh, so it didn't end up at all like uh, intended, but that is sometimes the advantage of knowing exactly the story and how you want to tell it when you set out writing the music. Because if I would have just sat down and written music, I would never have written that song, you know, in that way. But I was just trying to tell a story. And got lucky, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Wow. The Valley of Death, what the Bulgaria held them back. What was the story? I, I didn't get the story on that one. What was a quick, quick, quick? What's the story on that? Bat battle or battles of Doiran uh, on the Balkan front, British versus Bulga Bulgarians, as you say. And uh, I think they came back, the British, three, four times. Um, no, three times they came back, and the fourth, the Bulgarians weren't there anymore. <laughs> uh, but he was fighting Vasov, their commander. He was considered by the British to fight really honorably. So he was actually invited to uh, lecture at some sort of cadet school in the UK after the war. Mm. So they respected him sort of like, yeah, you fought, you were a good commander, you fought honorably. And to invite the guy who kicked your ass <laughs> to lecture is kind of 
impressive, I'd say. You know? yeah. 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 And despite the title, you know, Valley of Death, it's, it's kind of an uplifting song, you know, it's, it's, uh, Despite the title and the, the great sounding, the guitar break, the build up, everything about that song, it's, it's kind of uplifting. And with a title like The Valley of Death, you think it must be. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. And I, I never thought about that. But for me, me and Chris, when we wrote that, we were just realizing maybe there was a bit of alcohol involved. Uh, <laughs> that there are, why aren't there any guitar hero songs anymore? Like Jakey e. Lee, like Van Halen, where, you know, the guitar takes center place and there's actual riffs and melodies being played it's not just dun, 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 dun. the guitar is used as a percussion instrument without changing notes or carrying harmonies and stuff um so we sort of went for that yeah 80s guitar hero era of music that we grew up and loved and sort of went with the flow was yeah, and I think a dreadnought, dreadnought as well. That solo yes. has got that '80s feel so much. It's a slower, darker song, but at the end, it kind of picks up again. So, and I, I just love the, the guitar solo on that one. Yeah, I think Tommy did his best solo in Sabaton on that one so far. Actually, uh, he he really picked up on the song. You know what I mean? Sometimes a guitarist goes in and hey, this is what I can do, motherfuckers. <laughs> just go on with it. He, he has a really good, uh, what do you call it, sense for what the song needs, I guess. And I mean, obviously he could have played blazingly fast all the time, but he chose to borrow parts from the melody that's already there in the rhythms from the main riffs where he would borrow the rhythm of the riff from the main riff from the song, but play differently and add his own notes into the solo. It's hugely impressive how he, how he incorporated all that you know i, I think it? lady of the dark is another fantastic example yes, of the guitar yes, solo yes. just as you explained you know yeah yeah, yeah. that's why i say it's a much more mature album because of that it, it it seems like like you said the solo every song i have here is great solo great solo great solo great solo i mean great solos on here are amazing the keyboard some songs it's in the forefront some it just gives you that nice kind of background feeling Atmosphere, yeah yeah. We actually worked a lot with the guitars on this album because uh, it was one thing we wanted was to be able to get guitars <coughs> sorry, louder without them being too harsh. And when you have too much distortions, it's easy for them to sort of take over. It's too, you know, you can't hear them, you can't hear them, you can't hear them. Oh, no, they're too loud yeah. all of a sudden. And they sort of eat up the whole soundscape. So we actually got it heavier by reducing the distortion and changing, I mean, amp heads and a lot of other things. <coughs> so I think he was really outdid himself on the production on this one, which I think helped in the whole sound because I, I think mature is a good word uh, for it. It sounds more mature, the sound of it. And also yeah. the way Chris and Tommy plays now, they've been in the band for a couple of years now. Uh, they've... Uh, they're a few years older <laughs> than they were when maybe they joined, exactly, you know? They feel more comfortable. Maybe, of course, they're guitarists. They're always going to prove themselves and have a, you know, <laughs> guitar face-off at time, from time to time. But in a sense, it feels like they're more, yeah, uh, matured a little bit to play, play, play the songs instead of the guitar. Exactly. Do you think World War I was more brutal than World War II? Because there was a lot, there was more hand-to-hand -hand and more surprises with gas. And it was more of a brutal war for, for mankind or humanity. Yeah, I think so. Uh, mainly because, I mean, it was pretty short. We're talking four years here. And we went basically from Napoleonic era, you know, horses, sabers almost. A few armies and units still had those. And four years later, we see submarines, battleships, aeroplanes, tanks, um, gas being yeah. used for the first time. <coughs> so, I mean, it's really modern warfare growing up, and, you know, at least not maybe the full extent of it, but at least we get a hint of what's coming. I mean, stormtroopers, uh, obviously, same theory behind it as Blitzkrieg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, I would say it's very dark era. Uh, but it should be remembered also that 
at no other time during human history than those four years were there bigger bigger advances in the medical field. Yeah, I imagine so. With everyone. My, my personal favorite is the unkillable soldier. I mean, you, you start off with that big, like, Aventasia chorus and chorals and everybody's singing all at once and then you got that galloping guitars and the drums and it blends with the backing vocals and it's it's just so powerful that that's part i think that's probably they're all great but i, I have to pick one i would probably say that one. that's the biggest teaser we have as well because both me and the choirs are whispering on the first choruses it's not until the last one we actually go and blast out everything else we roll down the volume on the guitars and all the choirs are whispering you know obviously with modern mastering and uh, <clears throat> Compression, uh, it's not hugely, it's, it's still a dip in volume, but it's not as uh, much as it would have been without it. But, uh, and also one of the craziest guys ever yeah. I, I've read about. It's like a cartoon caricature of a crazy war guy that I don't know, but even Marvel could, could come up with that shit, you know? <laughs> the luckiest man. Um, <laughs> do you find, like, we spoke to Blaze Bailey and he's a big Sabaton fan. Do you find more and more, we'll call it legacy metal bands or the older classic metal bands are really now appreciating Sabaton and their place in metal, the metal world? Well, yeah, in a sense, uh, basically because we've gotten larger, we, we're getting lo large, so, so large that they can't, we can't be ignored in a, in a sense. But also people uh, have realized that we're sort of carrying on in many cases that tradition of uh, the classic metal because I mean, heavy metal or harder or extreme music in any sense is thriving and there's a lot of it. But as I touched on before with the, uh, yeah, maybe when I'm talking about Valley of Death, the, the old school classic guitar riffs as they were done before, mm -hmm. uh, the way of stringing melodies together. And I mean, our roots are basically 80s heavy metal. That's but what everybody but, but my, my point is, Blaze Bailey's new album has a bit of Sabaton in it. So it's it's sort of, you, you know, if, if you've listened to his new album or his last album, well, you should put it on because okay. you could see that there's a nod. There's a nod to Sabaton, mm -hmm. and he even acknowledged it. I think he did. He <laughs> said, did he, Alan? I think he did. He said, "Yeah," because you know he likes the band. So if you like, oh, he's a nice guy. Yeah, we did a we did a we surprised crashed his uh, <laughs> show in Warsaw. Oh, it's many years ago, six eight years ago maybe. Uh, we were down in Warsaw for promotion doing interviews me and pad and we were also going to a fan club meeting where the fan club was meeting mm -hmm. and we found out that blaze bailey was playing the next day and chris is a huge iron maiden fan of it so we called up chris and said <laughs> dude what are you doing tomorrow he's like uh nothing so go to fallen pick up all our stage clothes and get your ass on a first plane down to warsaw <laughs> so he actually flew down early the next morning and we talked to the promoter because we same guy had been, uh, been putting on shows with us as well and he snuck us in backstage while blaze was playing and then we sort of me chris and pat stormed the stage uh, on i can't remember if it was man on the edge or he was playing a, a maiden track and he just stormed the stage and you know surprised him <laughs> and then we had a lot to drink Good, I mean, good. we we can't finish this interview without talking about Soldier of Heaven. You know, uh, it's a heavy on the keyboards, and, and it's just too damn catchy not to talk about it. It's, it's and a great video to boot. So. Thanks. Uh, well, it's a it's a bit of a weird one because I mean, if you just take away, I mean, obviously the drums are regular drums played by Hannes, except for the toms, the same samples. Do, 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 yeah, do. they sound sampled. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know old electronic drum samples from the eighties music but other than that uh, it's a sort of an anti-reaction me and chris were writing harlan hellfighters together and at a certain point we thought oh there's too much going on all the time you know what we need a break let's do something that cannot have a you know complicated guitar riff it can have a guitar riff and everything but it cannot be complicated and that sort of became the starting point of the uh, soldier to heaven and I mean, in a sense, in the beginning, we instead of that dun, 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 uh, synthesizer that we, we use that also in like similar things in Shiroyama, Lost Battalion, and certain songs. But um, 
we had a guitar there first. And then we thought, this song has got a bit of an 80s vibe about the chorus, you know? Uh, I thought there was some kind of meatloaf in the, in the pre-chorus as well. I don't know if that's true, but I felt it like that. And then we just started, hmm, let's see. Yes, I've got some drum samples here. Aha, now it's 80s. No, now we need that. <laughs> and we need a hand clap. And then we thought, oh, you remember those guitars on Judas Priest Turbo with the yeah. tremolo? Oh, we need those in the chorus. And we started adding up stuff. We had a lot of fun. And that's <laughs> that's how it happened. Can anybody whistle? Can anybody whistle? No, I can't. <laughs> Leave it out. Leave it out. <laughs> no, nobody can. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, is there anything else? Or, Arden, Arden Ogan would have, you know, probably a little jealous about that song because it's something that they, it sounds like what they're able to do as well, you know? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a pretty good band. I, I haven't listened to much, but they pop up every now and then. And every time I'm like, hmm, this sounds good. I should check these guys out, but I still haven't. So I don't know. I've been too much in the making our own music and I don't want right. to listen to too much other music. Uh, when we spoke in August, you said this album is something special. You've played it to all kinds of different people. And I fully agree. I mean, I've been listening to Sabaton, saw you live. But there's something special about this album. What is it for you? I don't know. Maybe it's the first time in our career where uh, both the sound and things sort of came out the way we wanted it. Maybe that's what's coming through. I don't know. I'm not blaming any other producers or any past band members here, but I mean, uh, maybe it's the experience of us from Fine. in the band and also working with Jonas and him being able to get the best out of us as a producer, you know? Yeah, all right. That's it's it. well mixed, well produced, uh, and, and the songs, I mean, there's not a weak track on the album. So what we do every year is we pick what our top albums are of 2022. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is a leading candidate for me for, for the best album of the year. And yeah, everything's right gonna else, still February. <laughs> February. I know, but I measure everything against this album as far as I'm concerned. This is, it's, it's that strong of an album. Thank you. Thank you. Because it's, it's a thorough, thoroughly enjoyable and, listen. And I find it's more of a, uh, a grower too. Like on the first listen, you're going, okay. And then the more you listen to it, the more you absorb different parts of it. And it is a grower. It's, and it, those are the best albums. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to hear. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I do know that usually with Sabaton albums, there's, I've had so many people tell us over the years that it's like, I like this and this and this track on the first list. And then after five listens, you discover another one. And oh, then the usually hand clap. one of the ones you like falls off, you know. The hand clap. I noticed the hand clap. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. The war to end all war, wars, uh, March 4th, nuclear blast. Joaquin Brod Broden. Broden. <laughs> no worries. I'll stay. It's fine. Broden. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward to uh, seeing you guys on tour and congratulations on the album. Thank you very much, guys. Catch you Have next nice time. Day. Bye.